Welcome to Auto Mundial, the weekly car news and reviews show where this week we're checking out the latest hot SUVs from Jaguar and Alfa Romeo. We also have the all-new BMW i4 and Citroen's new C5X plus Hyundai updated i30N. That is all coming up, but first... Subaru is set to launch its new sixth generation Outback in Europe, despite poor recent sales figures. Last year, the Japanese brand sold just 951 cars in the UK, compared with just under 3,000 in 2019. The 68% drop can be linked partly to a plentiful supply of pre-registered 2019 cars, and also a lack of a click-and-deliver service during the COVID-19 pandemic. The new Outback can't come soon enough then, although we can't help but think that a return to selling high-performance compact saloons like the old Impreza WRX might help to turn around the brand's image in Europe. The Outback looks promising though, with a 50% reduction in body roll, improved ground clearance and approach angles, and a revised flat-4 engine now bumped up to 2.5 litres. We've had SUVs, we've had electric SUVs, we've had SUV coupes, and now inevitably we've got an electric SUV coupe. It really was only a matter of time. This is the new Audi e-tron Sportback, and it's a sleeker, sharper, meaner version of the regular car, an EV that we very much like. Audi has streamlined the roofline from the C-pillar backwards, hence the Sportback moniker. This swoopier shape isn't just all form and no function, though. The sloping silhouette gives the Sportback a better drag coefficient, which ups the range by about 6 miles to 240 on a single charge. As well as an efficiency boost, the Sportback also gets new headlights. We know the German marks love to pour their development into lighting technology, and Audi has equipped the Sportback with a set of digital matrix headlights. The advantages of this seemingly over-the-top tech are actually very clever and safety-sensitive. Some of the benefits include keeping your high beam out of incoming driver's sight and illuminating an individual motorway lane ahead of you, reducing glare to other road users. Incidentally, it also means that different lighting patterns can be illuminated when the car is unlocked. The sloping roof, submarine mirrors and sci-fi lighting pretty much complete the Sportback's list of changes. It shares its 402 horsepower dual-motor powertrain with the standard e-tron as well as the battery pack. Climb inside and there's even more copy and paste, which in this case is certainly no bad thing. If you love fancy infotainment systems, there are no better cars in which to travel. There's a 12-inch digital display behind the steering wheel, a 12-inch main touchscreen in the dashboard, and another 8-inch touchscreen below that. The extra efficiency does come at a price, though. There's about 20 mil less headroom for rear passengers, and about 5% has been chopped off the boot versus the standard e-tron. Performance remains similar to the standard car with 0 to 62 miles per hour dealt with in 5.2 seconds thanks to its 402 horsepower and all-wheel drive system. However, as we've mentioned, there are plenty of electric SUVs to choose from, including this, the impressive Mercedes EQC. At first glance, it may appear to be just a regular GLC, but look closer and you'll start to notice some of the Mercedes EQ Ranger's signature details. There are some fibre optic strips of lighting, a smooth front grille panel and a solid light bar across the boot lid. It doesn't shout about its eco credentials, with a fairly conventional interior filled with all the current Merc tech. Performance is on par with the Audi, shaving off a tenth of a second to 62, with 402 brake horsepower being sent through to all four wheels. 
Its range is similar to just beating the Audi at 259 miles. In conclusion then, the e-tron Sportback, like many coupe SUVs, doesn't really make a lot of sense. The Mercedes EQC and indeed the regular e-tron still look great, and are that little bit easier to live with every day. And best of all, they're cheaper. The performance SUV has long been dominated by the Germans. Every company from VW right up to Porsche has various track-inspired family haulers to choose from. But what about the rest of Europe? Well, one of our favourite fast 4x4s is this, the Jaguar F-Pace SVR. If you simply must have a two-ton gas guzzler that can keep up with a sports car, it may as well have a supercharged V8 that sounds like a Norse god shouting. Now though, after just a couple of years on sale, it's been updated. This is the new one, and like the regular F-Pace, it's been treated to a host of new gadgets and gizmos. The styling has also been refreshed, both inside and out. The F-Pace SVR still uses JLR's perennial 5-litre supercharged V8 that we've previously found in everything from F-Types to Range Rovers. In this guise, the engine produces the same 542 brake horsepower as the old version, but the new SVR is now good for 0-62 mph in 4 seconds flat thanks to its new launch control system. That puts it right up there with the very fastest in this class. The SVR gets a much sportier look than the regular car with a louvered bonnet, subtle rear spoiler and a lower, wider body kit. The whole car looks muscular without the garish trim and add-ons you'll find on the Range Rover Sport SVR. It's clearly a high-quality product, but is it good enough to justify its £78,000 price tag? Well, it needs to beat this, the current car to beat in this class, the powerhouse Alfa Romeo Stelvio Quadrifoglio. Like the Jag, the Stelvio is definitely a looker and has been subject to a recent refresh. It builds on the standard car with wider wheels and a lower, more aggressive stance. Using much of the chassis from the Giulio Quadrifoglio saloon and the same twin-turbo V6, the Stelvio puts out 503 brake horsepower, exactly the same as the smaller Alpha. It is down on power versus the F-Pace, but thanks to its lower weight, it beats the Jag to 62 in just 3.8 seconds. Both cars can do almost 180 miles per hour, so there is little to split them on paper. So how do they compare to drive then? Well, twist the Alpha's DNA dial to dynamic and the whole car feels immediately alive. It feels every bit as lively and energetic as the Julia with rapid acceleration and incredible grip. The exhaust makes some satisfying crackles on upshifts and you'll really have to push it to notice the car's bulk. Obviously, being a high-riding SUV, it has a pretty high centre of gravity, which you will notice when cornering hard. But overall, Alfa Romeo has done a superb job at making the Stelvio feel almost like a performance saloon. The Jag is a little more sedate. While the V8 still makes a glorious sound, it's not as conspicuous as the howling V6 of its Italian rival. It's arguably a bit more grown up, despite that characterful, if slightly old-fashioned engine. It is staggeringly fast, but it can settle down and be used easily every day. The boot is huge, and there's loads of space throughout. On a long journey, it's immensely comfortable and a far more pleasant environment than the rather dark and gloomy Alfa Romeo's cabin. But it's the engine that will be the main draw to buyers and the noise isn't as embarrassing as it is in the Range Rover Sport SVR, which uses the same motor. It looks classier too and the materials used are on par with its sister car. 
This then is the new performance SUV to beat and definitely a true rival to anything from Germany. After the break, new cars from Citroen and BMW plus the Hyundai i30X. Still to come, BMW's all-new EV, but first... Citroen has been on a bit of a roll recently, and it looks like that is set to continue with its latest new release, the CX-5. Now don't be fooled by the name, this is a very different sort of car from the funky C5 Aircross. It's the French brand's new flagship and harks back to an era where big Citroëns put one thing above all else, comfort. But this is not a big luxury saloon. Instead, it's a crossover with a popular high driving position and long travel suspension to soak up bumps and potholes. But while it does share a platform with the cutesy Aircross, the C5X looks more like a high-riding estate car, with a low roof line tapering off to a sculpted rear end. The front end looks a lot more premium too, with no air bumps in sight. Inside, the interior looks more like a DS model than a Citroen, with a clean, minimalist dashboard that's stylish enough to rival anything from Germany. It looks fabulous, and it should be practical too, with Citroen saying it offers unparalleled roominess. The elegant cabin is topped off by an all-new 12-inch infotainment screen that will get over-the-air updates as and when they're available. It even gets a mammoth 21-inch heads-up display to ensure you keep your eyes looking forwards. With an emphasis on luxury, the C5X also comes loaded with kit. High-spec cars get so-called advanced comfort seats and suspension with three modes to make the most of the progressive hydraulic cushions that are standard across the range. Other bells and whistles include voice recognition wireless phone charging and level two autonomous capabilities with adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist. Under the bonnet, the C5X is likely to share power units with the regular C5 Aircross. Citroen has said it won't be offering a diesel option, meaning it'll likely get the familiar 1.2 petrol three-cylinder, putting out roughly 130 horsepower. There will be a plug-in hybrid version too, offering a combined 222 bhp. There's no word on an electric version just yet, but French deliveries are due to start at the end of the year, with an early 2022 release date likely for the UK. The C5X is representative on Citroën's steady rise to a more premium part of the market. It is a car with no real direct rivals, but one we hope proves to be just as good as it looks. It's no secret that we're big hot hatch fans here at Auto Mundial. And one of our favourite of recent years is this, the Hyundai i30M. A true old school fast hatchback, it combines great performance with sporty styling and all the practicality you'd find in a regular i30. Best of all, it gets a proper manual gearbox, a feature that seems to be getting rarer and rarer. And now it's been updated. The changes may be subtle, but they're certainly effective. It's had a very mild facelift with some smart new headlights and a wider, flatter grille. The aerodynamics have also been tweaked to improve airflow. There are more changes at the back with a new spoiler, a triangular brake light and bigger exhaust pipes to further boost the sporty image.
Performance pack versions also get a set of beautiful 19-inch forged alloy wheels with grippy Pirelli P0 tyres which shave over 14 kg of unsprung mass. Inside though, the changes are more obvious. There's a new 10 and quarter inch infotainment screen complete with Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. There are also some sporty new graphics and the ability to customise engine exhaust and steering modes. There's also a pair of new lightweight Alcantara bucket seats to finish off the well-appointed cabin. The two-litre turbocharged four-cylinder engine remains from the old car, but power has now been turned up by five horsepower to 278 bhp, while torque has also been increased ever so slightly. And while that lovely six-speed manual remains the standard transmission, there is also now the option to have an eight-speed DCT with paddle shifts. The auto box has been specially tuned to deliver aggressive changes to mimic the feeling of shifting with a stick. So far, so good then, but this is a hotly contested class. And to get to the top of it, the Hyundai faces some very stiff competition. And the current class favourite is still this, the remarkable Honda Civic Type R. Recently updated, the Type R is still as mad as ever. It's still covered in spoilers and awkward-looking aero bits that we just find rather embarrassing. Thankfully, the interior is somewhat more tasteful, with fabulous bucket seats and the signature metal gear knob. Out on the road, it remains absolutely stunning. It may be a front-wheel drive hatchback with 316 brake horsepower, but the clever differential does a superb job of keeping the front wheels in check as it pulls you around tight corners with minimal understeer. It can hit 62 miles per hour from rest in under six seconds onto a top speed of nearly 170. But if you don't fancy driving around in a car that's been styled by a sugar-fueled child, there's always this, the Renault Megane RS. In particular, the RS Trophy model. With 296 brake horsepower, its performance puts it somewhere in the middle between the pure i30 and the swivel-eyed Civic. The Trophy also comes as standard with the cut chassis, an option on the regular car. This includes some stiffer suspension and a limited slip differential to help get all that power down onto the road through the front wheels. The Trophy also shaves off 0.1 of a second off the regular car's 0-62 time at 5.7 seconds with the manual gearbox. Top speed is 162 miles per hour, four more than the normal Megane RS. But while those numbers are very impressive, it's what it feels like behind the wheel that counts. Put your foot down and there is a hint of turbo lag before a surge of power in the mid-range. It feels noticeably quicker than the standard car, helped by a new, louder exhaust, which pops and bangs when you lift off the throttle. The cup chassis helps the Megane to feel like a proper Renault hot hatch. It's stiff and taut, giving you confidence. While the Hyundai remains slightly less powerful than the Honda and the Renault, it still remains a great buy. It looks sporty without being in your face, and it's great to drive without being compromised. It may not be the most exciting on the track, but as an everyday car, it's the one that we'd go for. With a flurry of new EVs hitting the showrooms this year, there is no shortage of choice, especially if you're after a saloon. Porsche and Audi have released new four-door electric cars, as has Polestar, Volvo's electric offshoot. But if none of these Tesla alternatives quite take your fancy, BMW has this, the all-new i4. Joining the iX, iX3 and, of course, the ageing i3 and i8, the i4 is, to all intents and purposes, an electric 3 Series. But look a bit closer and you'll notice it's a bit bigger, giving us a hint towards what the upcoming 4 Series Grand Coupe will probably look like, big grille and all. 
It's borrowed some styling cues from the Concept i4 we saw last year and has plenty of aerodynamic bits and pieces to maximise potential range. Top spec M performance versions will get 523 brake horsepower and a 0 to 62 time of about 4 seconds according to BMW, while the WLTP range is said to be around 360 miles. Best of all, it will be rear wheel drive, meaning it should be fun to drive while still holding on to some of that BMW DNA. Despite originally being scheduled for release in 2022, BMW is apparently so pleased with the i4 that it'll be hitting showrooms in Germany three months early, with the first customer cars due to hit the roads in autumn of this year. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we check out the all-new Volkswagen Golf R.